The Epistle of Paul to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially unto me, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Especially unto me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So here another one of those letters that the Apostle Paul sent out. Uh, this one right after Timothy, right after Titus, is the book of Philemon before Hebrews. And here the Apostle Paul, in true fashion, gives his salutation unto his beloved brethren. The salutation is one that comes from Paul here, and also Timothy, when he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And I love the Apostle Paul and his salutations. Immediately lays out who is writing and who he is writing to. That way you can grasp, if you were to go scripture to scripture and find different portions, perhaps who is being referred to and what context that they lived in and what church that they went to and all these sort of things. Philemon here is one that's uh, kind of vague and in obscurity, but he has an own, his own book written directly to him. And while he's not as well known as, say, Timothy, he is indeed well known because he's contained within the scriptures. And we can learn a lot about Philemon and his interactions with the Apostle Paul just by looking at this beloved scripture. He says, unto Philemon here, this is Paul and Timothy writing, to beloved and fellow laborer, dearly beloved, he even lifts up Philemon as a dearly beloved and fellow Labor. Adding to this, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So here, um, Aphia and Archippus, perhaps Aphia the wife and Archippus the son. I see that, that term, our fellow soldier, um, as kind of like an endearing term. I'll, I'll lift it up because we know that Philemon here would be the head. He's the primary one that's being addressed to. And I just have in my mind that perhaps Aphia and Archippus is just a co-laborer with them. Perhaps he's a son of Philemon. I'm not exactly sure. You do find reference to him, and you can go look up in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12, if you so desire, to Archippus. And it's in that context that 
the Apostle Paul just encourages him to stay faithful in the works that he's doing. So Archippus, no doubt, is a fellow soldier. He is a fellow laborer. And I like this. He says, and to the church in thy house. Again, giving credence to the idea that the church is not the building that they're in. The church is within the house, that they meet in the house. And even as we meet now in this office space, and last week we met in a house, the location is irrelevant. The church is the body of believers. The church is the congregation of saved, called out, that assembly of believers. The meeting location then is not the primary focus to what a church is. Though some people think that. I went looking for your church, some would say, and they would probably end up, if they're in this area, at the big building across the road with the high steeple and the few people. But in reality, they're going to find a little office space with just a few people meeting. It's irrelevant, the meeting place. The church is the body. And our church, I believe, to be one of the strongest within Toronto because of the body, because of the believers, and because of our desire to reach the lost. I love this church. I love these people. And here, the Apostle Paul is writing unto a church that I believe he has the same respect for, the same desire towards. Because he says in verse 3, as he often does, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a very common salutation of Paul. In Romans, it says the exact same thing. It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians, the same thing basically with different wording. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. In Thessalonians, it's the same thing. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. The one thing that I noticed that was interesting was in the salutation that he gave to Timothy and to Titus. He added a word. He said, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you, Timothy. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you, Titus. I don't know if because of their position they were in need of mercy. I don't know what it was that provoked him to add mercy unto his salutation to these particular men and withhold it. Um, <clears throat> what, what emphasis that is or what that really means. But nonetheless, it was something that I noticed. And we as Christians, as the Apostle Paul did, should extend the same salutation. And that salutation doesn't always have to be something that's just in word, but it rather should be in deed. We shouldn't just be saying, you know, grace to you, brother, peace to you, brother, and that's just it. It's just something with lip service that we cast out abroad as we go about our day. But no, we should actually from the heart minister grace unto people. We should actually from the heart minister peace unto you. And really hope that the people that we're saluting would experience the same grace and peace in their lives. So don't minister just in word when you say, you know, God bless you. Hey, really from the heart, hope that God blesses your brethren. And that's the right attitude among the congregation. I believe that's the attitude that this congregation specifically has. And we need to, in the same way as we hope that would be something that people receive just in general, we hope that grace and peace would be something that we extend unto our life. We're constantly ministering in these areas as the Apostle Paul did. Grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is praying that they would receive of the same. In verse 4 it says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3 he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And this is another way that Christians can really work in a congregation is when at every remembrance, who knows, maybe God's putting on your heart just the remembrance as I'm in my day about Samson. And I, I just in that moment would just find remembrance of him. He comes to my mind and use that opportunity to thank God for him. And as it says in verse 4, thanking the God making mention of him always in my prayers. Perhaps God places those situations in your life where you're just going about your day and you think of a brother in Christ. Perhaps he prompts you as an opportunity for you to lift him up in prayer. Just thank God for him. We need to be praying Christians who every opportunity, every remembrance of one of our brothers, of one of our sisters, we just seek to lift them up before God. Thank God for them. Rejoice that we know them. Rejoice that we have ministered with them. They have ministered unto us. Just be thankful in general one for another. That's, that's a tell of a true Christian church. They love one another. They're thankful one for another. And they're always praying unto God in that same spirit. They're rejoicing 
with thanksgiving that they know the person and they're lifting them up. I don't know how many times I've experienced it where I thought of somebody late at night and I prayed for them only to find out the next day that, that exact moment they were going through something unheard of and just, just rotten and just really terrible. And God just laid it on my heart to pray. Lord, I don't even know what I'm praying for, but this person's on my heart. And in obedience, I did so. And I was able to, through my prayers, minister what to them? grace and peace and help them through that situation by lifting them up before the God that can do all things, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who can do all things in their lives and minister unto them even when I can't because I'm far away. And as a church that has people that can meet one hour, two hours, 45 minutes, we're from all over the area. The best way that we can stay connected one with another is to pray one for another. Yes, we come together and we work on Saturday. We come together and we grow and we, we learn and we're taught of the scriptures on Sunday. But how about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? We're all in different parts of the southern Ontario here. We can still touch each other's lives personally by pleading to God for one another. Verse 5 says, Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward Lord Jesus and toward all saints. So here Paul rejoices. He's thankful for them and he's rejoicing of the love and faith that he hears that they are in. So the interesting thing again is Paul, as he always was and often was, is far removed from the churches that he has a close and personal fellowship with. And so quite often he would have to pray and reach out. And quite often when he learned about the situations that were going on within the church's life, he had to hear of it from afar. And here he's hearing of their love. He's hearing of their faith that they have toward Jesus and this, all saints. And he's rejoicing in that. He, you can almost hear the joy as it spills over into chapter or into verse 6 there. You can hear the joy in his voice when he writes and talking about what he's praying unto God for. Verse 4 ends off and he says, making mention of thee always in my prayers. And the prayer is this, verse 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And that's important. The good things are in you in Christ Jesus. So he's hearing of the great things. He's praying for them. He's thankful for them. And his prayer is that the communication of their faith may become effectual. That means successful. That means something that is producing the desired result. The true intent of the communication of their faith would come to fruition. And this is something, again, communication isn't always just verbal. Communication is action. Communication is doing. It is basically the complete embodiment of who you are. Nonverbal and verbal communication alike makes up what communication is. It's your acts, whether verbal or whether physical. So how, do their, how does their communication of the faith become effectual? How does it successfully produce the desired results, the end of what faith is supposed to do in the communication thereof? By this, by acknowledging, it's, it's plain here in the scriptures, the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So we know that according to the scriptures, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And that's going to be a scourge on my side, a thorn for the end, till the end of days, until I breathe my last breath, right? And I'm resurrected anew. But though in me dwelleth no good thing, that is in my flesh, there is also every good thing that is attributed unto the Lord Jesus Christ, who is perfect in me when I'm in Christ. And here's what needs to happen. You need to acknowledge, you need to reckon, and by faith believe that every good thing which is in Christ Jesus is also in you when you're in Christ. Doesn't that make sense? If we are in Christ, then His goodness, His attributes are also accustomed to us. Our new man is as Christ. And our new man is currently trapped and associated with a rotten flesh, and he's trapped with that for the moment. But here's what happens in the Christian's life. We need to acknowledge. We need to render. We need to reckon. We need to believe that every good thing is in you in Christ Jesus. So this is how our faith becomes effectual. Our faith truly becomes effective and when, is when by faith we believe it to be so. By faith we believe that, hey, 
I used to cuss and drink and smoke and chew and all those things. But that is the old man, and the new man does not do all those things. The new man is not lustful. The new man is not carnal. The new man is not envious. The new man does not strive. And so what we do in order to communicate our faith purposefully and with the right purpose is to believe those things. By faith, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. This is the prayers that he is making, the Apostle Paul is making of the church that Philemon is overseeing. He is praying that Philemon would have that effectual communication, that his faith would be seen and would be shed abroad. Even if Philemon doesn't necessarily understand the ins and outs of all that thing, isn't it good to know that there is somebody praying for you, that you would have those characteristics, that Christ would be seen in you, that Christ would be formed in you? That's such a blessing. And we, one for another, can pray those same things. Look, I don't know all the problems that each and every one of you have. I don't know the things you're struggling with, the things that your flesh desires, the things that your carnal mind desires, the thing that the old man always wants to get on top of, like a, like a wild dog and just rip, you know, he's just hungry for it, right? I don't know those things, but if I pray for you that Christ would be formed in you and that every good thing which is in Christ would be seen in you and I'm just constantly asking for Christ to have the preeminence, I am encouraging you indirectly and through the spiritual realm that your communication, the communication of your faith, would be effective. Right? I don't know what you're struggling with, but I know that you're not as Christ. And you're not as much as Christ as you ought to be. And more and more and more and more each day, the Bible says that Christ's image is being formed in us. And that's the desire here of the Apostle Paul, and that's even, even the desire of myself towards each and every one of you, that Christ would be glorified in you, in your communication, how you live, and you would acknowledge the truth that the good things that are in you are the same good things that are in Christ Jesus, and you would walk as he walks. Verse 7, the Apostle Paul is rejoicing in these things. He says, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Addressing him here in that endearing term, brother. I am rejoicing that your great love and your ministering to the hearts of the saints and the bowels of compassion, essentially the core of the saints are being refreshed here by Philemon. The Apostle Paul has heard of this. Wouldn't it be great if each and every one of us could look around the room and know that each and every one of us were somebody that is ministering to the bowels, refreshing the saints. There's somebody that's always encouraging, lifting up, strengthening the saints. And this is what the Apostle Paul saw from afar in a man like Philemon. He has great joy and consolation because the saints are being refreshed by the ministry here of Philemon. He has great things to say unto him, great things to say about him. And here now, though, Paul gets to the point of why he's writing. You ever start to read a letter and somebody will make an introduction to you and you're like, okay, well, what's, what's the point? They didn't, they didn't just write unto me to say all these great things. But the Apostle Paul, he was really good at to give positive encouragement, to give a negative statement perhaps, right? Because that, that's his job as the preacher. But then he always reinforces it again with more positive and encouragement because he wants to, to build up people, to give them the hard truth, and then to build them up again. So he's going to start to get to his point of why he wrote on them. And I love how he does it because you really get to see a side of the Apostle Paul that I don't think you see very often. You see a little bit more of his person come out because you'll find out that he, he refers to himself here as, as Paul the Aged and also a prisoner. He's at the end of his life now. And so if anybody's been around people when they get a little bit older, it gets to the point where they're just not going to hold back. They're going to tell you what they think. They're going to they're gonna let you have it, right? They just kind of let it all out there. And here you find the Apostle Paul. He, he, he lets a little bit of his his sarcastic side, I believe, come out. He lets a little bit of his, his playful side come out. He's not, he's not so serious here, but, but I do love the, the reading of this scripture because of that. He says, wherefore, in verse 8, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. His wording here, though it may be a little bit confusing, Paul is basically saying he could be bold. He could just let him have it. He could tell him exactly what he wants from him at this moment. Though I could be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Enjoin, that simply means instruct or urge. He could be very bold. He could urge. He could instruct Philemon. In other words, 
lay down the law. Tell him exactly what needs to happen at this moment, at this time. He, he said, I could be bold. I could instruct you. I could encourage you. I could urge you to do what is convenient, to do what is appropriate, to do what is right. I could be bold and just outright say, hey, here's the law, do it, right? He could tell him, and it's something that's convenient. It's something so that when he hears that truth, Philemon would know, yeah, that's right, because that's normal, because that is what is appropriate, because that is fitting to do in such and such a situation. But the Apostle Paul says this, he says, yet, for love's sake, I rather beseech thee. And I like that, because he leaves it up to Philemon to respond, and he's leaving what he's going to talk about as a question, as, as something that is open and needs appropriate response from Philemon at this time. He says, I could be bold, I could instruct you, I could tell you to do what's appropriate, but instead I'm going to ask, I'm going to beseech thee. And he says this, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I like this, because when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he saw it, he said, do I come unto you with a rod or in love? Right? He was dealing with them about their issue of having fornication in the church. And he said, when I come again, is it going to be with a rod or is it going to be in love? And he, and he very firmly said with, with intent that he was going to show up. And he's going to show up in one or two persons. He's just going to be very happy and rejoicing and in love. Or he's going to lay down the law and he's going to swing the rod and he's going to chasten and correct the church. But here the Apostle Paul is in a completely different fashion. He says, being such an one as Paul the age, now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's admitting to the fact that, hey, I could come down there finally and I could lay down the law, but... I'm in jail and I'm old. <laughs> I'm in jail and I'm old. So I'm not going to be coming down and knocking down your door. It's, it's done for me. You don't, you don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to beseech thee. I'm going to ask thee. I'm going to seek thee to do what's right. right? I, the, the younger Paul would have come down there and ripped some face. And he would have just told you how it is. And he would have just said this and that. right? But what, what can I do? I'm, I'm old and I'm in jail. That's what he's saying here. I, being Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So here he's going to continue on in this beseeching spirit. He's going to ask him, as the aged prisoner of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul says in verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bond. So here again, the Apostle Paul shows himself to be a soul winner, even in dire straits, even when he's locked up in prison. And he says this, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. Now some people might say, oh, well then the Apostle Paul had children then. Well, that wouldn't fit with the next statement, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Paul wasn't getting married and having children when he's in prison. No, he had begotten him by giving him the gospel and by getting him saved. And now he becomes a son of Paul. He becomes a spiritual son of Paul because he led him to the Lord. Talking about Onesimus here. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, the interesting thing about this, and I don't know if you have it, at the end after verse 25, does anyone have a little, a little hash there? It says, written from Rome to Philemon by Onesimus, a servant. Do you have that written there? How many do you have? One, two, about half of us. <clears throat> so at the end of it, my Bible has this, this little uh, paragraph line. It says, written from Rome to Philemon by Onesimus, a servant. Now some people think that those statements there are, are inspired and they should be there. I don't necessarily believe so because first of all, only what, a third of us have it? Uh, second of all, I've seen, I've seen things that I don't think are exactly right about that. I think that's probably just, just added notes that were put in there by, by the King James translators in order to give us some clarity. There, there could be some truth in this. I mean, um, it seems to fit the situation. But if that is the truth, is that it was written from Rome, which we know the Apostle Paul, that's where he ended up as a prisoner. Unto Philemon, okay, that makes sense, right? Because he addressed the whole letter to Philemon to the church in his house. And it says, by Onesimus' servant. So what I think happened, and, and what that would indicate, is that Onesimus showed up with the letter that Apostle Paul is asking Philemon to beseech about. He, he has the letter in his hand, and so before he even saw the letter that the Apostle Paul was beseeching him for, him, he saw Onesimus. And so it might have been a shock here, if anyone knows about the background of this. Essentially, I think what happened was Onesimus was a servant of Philemon, and he took off. He probably robbed him. He probably ripped him off. He probably did him dirty. Because usually when you're a servant in the Bible, it's because you owe a debt. You become, you become an, a servant unto your master in order to fulfill a debt. So the Onesimus probably took off. 
found himself in prison, found himself before the Apostle Paul, saved, and now the Apostle Paul sends him back unto his same master with a letter in hand. So you got to think that when the door is knocked and Philemon sees Onesimus on the other side of the door, he could be pretty upset. And Onesimus is just like, you know, I have apostolic immunity. I have immunity. Just read the letter first before you, you come at me. That's the general story, the most, most common story I've heard associated with this. And it, and it makes sense given the context that we read. So again, at the end of that, we have that Onesimus, a servant, was the one that brought this letter. <clears throat> but either way, you find out, if you don't want to buy that, either way, you find out that Onesimus is one that is specifically and personally known of by Philemon. Verse 11 says, Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. So he does have a personal relationship that the Apostle Paul is well aware of. And in time past, Philemon, Onesimus was unprofitable. But he says this, but now he's profitable to thee and to me. The letter says very plainly, here is Onesimus, I know that he did you wrong. I know that he was worthless to you. I know that he was very unprofitable. But now I'm sending him to you again and he's profitable unto me, and how much more unto thee? Because in verse 12 it says, Whom I have sent again, right? So if he, had, if he was sent again, it means he started there to begin with. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. So it's interesting to note, as you read through this, you're going to see some pictures of salvation. Salvation does this same thing to us. It takes someone that is unprofitable and makes them profitable. In other words, for the ministry, for the work, for the time to come. God takes an unprofitable person that was estranged from them. Jesus Christ grabs a hold of us and sends us back to the Father. And when he sends us back into the Father, he says, Father, this man was unprofitable to thee in time past, but now he's profitable unto thee both in the flesh and in the Lord. And he says he's profitable not only unto the Father, Jesus says he's profitable unto me. I like how the Apostle Paul pictures the type of Christ as he brings salvation unto Onesimus and returns him unto his rightful master, who would be pictured as the Father in this situation. And when he does so, he says, hey, he's now profitable unto thee. The Apostle Paul says, Philemon, this was not, and now he is profitable unto Unto thee. So even us, when we're reconciled with God, yes, we have the decision, right? Onesimus was given the letter and sent. And in good faith, the Apostle Paul sent Onesimus there, trusting that he would actually bring the letter to the Apostle Paul. Now what happens with some of us? We get saved in the prison. We're released from the prison. Glory to God. And on our way back to be profitable unto the Father... We get distracted and we go to something else, right? How many people do you see saved out in the streets that on their way to being profitable unto God because they've received the salvation provided by Jesus Christ, on their way they get distracted and they remain unprofitable. But they're free from prison, are they not? They're free from death and hell and the condemnation associated with that, but they've turned aside. So we too, though, we can be profitable unto the Father. How do we do that? Remember verse 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So if we, have, if we acknowledge the good things that Christ has put in us and the communication of our faith links up with that and we yield to the things that Christ is putting into us, every good thing that Christ is putting to us, if we trust those things by faith and apply them to our lives, we too can communicate our faith effectually. We too can become profitable unto the Father. Even as Onesimus was released from prison, it took him going to the Father with the letter to be reconciled and to be profitable at that time. Like I said, when he was free, he could have just went and he had free will to do whatever he wants. Remember, Paul's old. Paul's in prison. He's not going to do anything, right? He is separate from the situation, but he left Onesimus, sent him, and he hoped that the Father here would receive him. He sent him, as it says in verse 12, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. And again, he says this, that is mine own bowels, that is my heart. Another statement we would see in the Old Testament would be a man after mine own heart. So the Apostle Paul sent Onesimus in good faith. He knew the man well. Why? Because he referred to him as his son. 
He said he was begotten of him while he was in his bonds. And he says here, he is mine own bowels. He is, the, he is of, my, of me. He is essentially of my heart. He's a man after mine own heart. And this is the man that Paul sends unto Philemon. He gives Philemon the benefit of having the option to accept him. Right? He's not laying down the law. He's not saying, I'm, gonna, I'm going to enjoin thee that which is convenient. I'm going to tell you to do what is right and force you to do such a thing. I am out of love going to beseech thee that you would receive him who was in past unprofitable. He's profitable now, but know this. He's my son. He's, he was begotten in my bonds. My own bowels yearn after him. I love this man. Receive him as if you were receiving me. In verse 13, again, it says, Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. So here the Apostle Paul is, is vehemently assuring the fact that he is profitable now as a minister. That, that Paul is almost, almost unwillingly kind of letting go of Philemon. He said, I would have retained him. I would have retained him with me. That in thy stead, because I don't have you here with me, Philemon, I would rather he stay and minister unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But anyways, he is sending him nonetheless. He has sent him to be received of Philemon at the time. Verse 14, But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. And here the plea again is that, Philemon, would you please receive Onesimus willingly? I'm not charging you. I'm not forcing you. I'm not commanding you. Just accept him as if you're accepting me. He's going to start to explain. So here very clearly we see that there's an acknowledgement of a departure that was not good between Philemon and Onesimus. But the Apostle Paul here vehemently assuring him, Hey, Onesimus is my son. He was begotten in my bonds. He is mine own bowels. And given the context and you see the separation that was not good, it must have been a little shocking for Philemon to see Onesimus at the other side of that door. But think of what he received. Grace and peace extended from his old friend, the Apostle Paul, who he knew was in prison. Perhaps he didn't even know if he was alive anymore, but he receives the letter with the man that had turned from him, had been unprofitable unto him. And with it, he receives a letter that actually tells of that man that was unprofitable's now profitableness. Here, he appeals that while Onesimus had done some rotten things in the past, that now the situation is such that what happened might have been God ordained. Yeah, even him messing on you and turning from you and leaving you. It might have been God orchestrated, Philemon. It might have been God honored, even the end result of all the things that had happened. He says in verse 15, For perhaps, okay, perhaps he, Onesimus, therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Perhaps all of this was to the end that while he was unprofitable then, and he left you for a time and it hurt you bad, it was to the end that thou shouldest receive him forever. Maybe God had his hands in this. He ordained it. He orchestrated it. Maybe he's honoring even the decision that's being made to send him back. What he is pleading now for Philemon is to understand that the past is past. He needs to, him to understand that now Onesimus is a son, begotten. He is of my own bowels. And so in verse 15 he says, Perhaps he departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, but not in the same state that he was in. And isn't that a wonderful thing that when Christ saves us, he doesn't send us to the Father in the same state that we were in. If Christ was to save us and send us figuratively into the same position that we we're in, what would happen? Complete destruction. No, what happens is Christ sends us unto the Father, but we have a covering. We have a letter. We have a post of, of, of innocence. We have, Father, forgive him. He knows not what he does. We have complete salvation because the blood of Christ has cleansed us from all sins. He's going to look upon us when we're received and see a completely different person than the person that was estranged from him, that was unprofitable unto him. It says here in verse 16, not now as a servant. So perhaps you should have received him forever, not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh 
and in the Lord. He's encouraging him to receive him, and he's now not just his servant. He's not the same man that ran away from you. He is above a servant. He's a brother beloved. Why? Because he's a son of Apostle Paul. He's begotten of Apostle Paul. He's after the Apostle Paul's own heart. Receive him, he says. Receive him above a servant, beloved unto me especially, but how much more unto thee, and I love this, in the flesh and in the Lord. See, in our interactions, quite often, we're willing to receive one another in the Lord. He's a Christian brother. I love him as a Christian brother. But when it comes to receiving the flesh of one another, that's what we don't like. We're, we, we don't like so-and-so's faults, so-and-so's faults. We don't like how they talk, how they look at me, how they think. How they, we don't like the flesh of people, but we're willing to receive them in the Lord. Here the Apostle Paul encourages Philemon to receive him both in the flesh and in the Lord. And we need to be able to do the same. We need to receive with grace and peace, minister grace and peace one to another. We need to love each and every one of us amongst the other, the in the Lord side, and also the in the flesh side. We need to be able to live one with another, and we need to be reminded of the fact that I think Philemon is being reminded of at this moment, that each and every one of us has flesh that stinks. And we don't like each other's flesh, and our flesh doesn't get along. But what is our commonality? Well, we're brethren. We're sons and daughters of God. We have the same Father. So we're united in that, but you know what the thing is, is that though we're united and we all have a spiritually perfect new man within us, we still have the carnally natured old man that goes with us everywhere we go. And it stinks and it's flesh and it's rotten and it's no good. But we need to receive each other in the flesh and in the Lord because it's a package deal. And sometimes that means we have to be patient one with another. Sometimes it means we have to be long-suffering one with another. We need to what? Minister grace and minister peace that comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is what is being charged. He says, receive him forever, not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved in the flesh and in the Lord. And I love this. We're going to see that picture of Christ again in verse 17. It says, If thou count me, therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Didn't Christ say that when he went to the Father? He says, If you count me a partner, if I'm a part of the Godhead, receive so-and-so as myself. Receive Josh Gander as myself. He says, Hey, if I am Christ, if I am God, and you love me, Father, and you lift me up, Father, and if you have exalted me, Father, then receive this child as myself. He is stepping in his place. Philemon loved the Apostle Paul, but he probably had some, some contempt for Onesimus for what has gone wrong. He says, Philemon, if you count me, the Apostle Paul, therefore a partner, if we're a part in this, if we're fellowshipping together, if we are united, if we are bonded, receive Onesimus in the same spirit. If he hath wronged thee, verse 18, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. There's that substitutionary atonement there. There's that exchange. Father, if he has sinned against you, put it on mine account. Didn't he take that on the cross? Father, receive him as if you are receiving me. And Christ became sin unto us, and we became Christ unto the Father. Why? Because he looked at us and saw the perfected state of Christ. No sinlessness. And that was completely received by the faith. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. And here the Apostle Paul seals it as Jesus Christ sealed it. He says, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say unto thee how thou owest unto me, even thy own self beside. Here he lays out that Paul's word is good. He says, my word is good. I have written it with mine own hand. If Onesimus hath wronged thee, put it on my account. If you count me a partner, receive him as you would have received me. And then he says this, another, another tongue-in-cheek statement, albeit, I do not say unto thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self beside. Don't, don't let me remind you, don't make me remind you, Philemon, that, that you owe me. You owe me my life. I believe that Philemon was a man that was heavily indebted unto the Apostle Paul. I believe I am a man that is heavily 
indebted on the Apostle Paul because how much of this did he write up for me, right? We, we can all look to that great heritage that the Apostle Paul left and we can, we can see ourselves as indebted unto them. And here Philemon gets that statement. He says, hey, receive him as if you're receiving me. Hey, if he has wronged you, if he owes you, put it on my account. But you know you got some debts with him, buddy. <laughs> He's just kind of poking at him. I, I see that as kind of a, as kind of an ingest statement because he, he already said that he's not coming at him. He's giving him the option. But I like how he extends that kind of light touch to it. The Apostle Paul is showing a little bit of humanity. He says, I do not say unto thee how that was unto me, thine own self besides. And then gets right into the, the salutation out. He says, Yea, brother, let me have joy in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou will also do more than I say. So a little bit of this back and forth and jesting and communication, I believe, was profitable unto us because now we can read it and we can get a little bit more of a glimpse. But the Apostle Paul here, even before he wrote this, he, would ju he just knew in his heart that Philemon would not only receive him but do above what was asked because of his heart, because he desired, when Onesimus left him, he didn't let him go and, and have contempt for him. His desire was as the father unto the son that, that ran away and ended up in the pig pen, the, the son to the product, the father to the prodigal. He desired that Onesimus would come back and would serve unto him. And how much more did he rejoice when he received him as a repentance saved individual, as, as a man that had been born again, as a man who is now a son of Paul, as a man who above all was a son of God, begotten in prison, begotten in the mire, begotten in the trouble that he had gotten himself into, he receives him, and the Apostle Paul writes this letter encouraging, just in case, Philemon to receive him as he receives himself. But all the while, the Apostle Paul said, Yea, brother, help me to rejoice with you in this. Help me to understand. Help me to have that refreshing in my bowels, that sin that you minister unto so many people that I've heard of you. I'm confident that you will not only do what I say and receive Onesimus as a brother and above a brother as, as family, as, 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 as a, a very bowels as I have, as the very heart of hearts of myself. He gets, says, I have confidence in you, Philemon, to do the same, but not only that, above that. And then he says this, in true faith, as the Apostle Paul always does, even though he said, you know, I'm, I'm old and I'm in prison, and kind of gave that glimmer of hopelessness, he follows it up with verse 22 where he says, But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Maybe that was never realized on this side of eternity. But the reality is, is that the Apostle Paul never gave up hope, even when he was in prison, that he would see some of his beloved friends again. But here at this time and this point of his life, he wasn't going to come at them with that same boldness and, you know, I'm coming at you. He, he was going to entreat people that he had confidence with to do the things that he needed them to do. And we need to be the type of people that when somebody's in a dire strait, they don't need to ask us and beg us and plead with us and force us to do right for them. <coughs> we need to be as Philemon was the Apostle Paul, where people can count on you to just do what they're pleading that you would do and above that. In other words, Philemon was the type of Christian that when the Apostle Paul asked him of something, he did it and he did it above measure. And we see that play out here. With all, prepare me also, love you, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you that hope given that, hey, I will one day see you again. Keep praying for me, and I thank you for the same. The Apostle Paul, as we often know, he wasn't always alone when he was there in prison. He had many come and minister unto him. The Bible records at the end of at the end of Timothy that he was given opportunity to police, to preach and to minister and to have people come and visit him. And he says this, there salute the Epaphras. So, so there are salutations being sent from Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. He's with me here in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The Apostle Paul always having good men surrounding him and laboring with him and even stuck in prison with him, having church services there, not in the house, but in the, in the prison cell. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. His final salutation and sign out is just, again, ministering grace of the Lord. Be it with your spirit. Be that same peace with your spirit. God willing. God says it so. Amen. He puts that stamp of approval, that final sealing upon it. I love this story because, again, it gives a 
picture of the Apostle Paul in his relation with people. Even at the end of his days, he was still trying to minister unto people to do right, but he had confidence in those that he asked to do right, that they would do the same. Why? Because they were just as Onesimus, sons begotten of him, his own bowels. He had a heart for them. He prayed for them. He reached out to them. And when he finally wrote the letter, when he finally presented them with the word of God, he was confident that they would be obedient within the same. Uh,